Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to episode number eight of History for Shut-Ins as we move forward in the Revolutionary War, talking about the battles of Assunpink Creek, Princeton, Saratoga, and Brandywine. So let's get started. We left off at the last class after the Battle of Trenton, which really turns the morale of the Patriots, which had been sinking through 1776 after the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Siege of Boston, and, and really it's the Siege of New York City that turns things. So the Battle of Trenton takes place on Christmas Day. It's the colonial forces against the Hessians. There are no British soldiers involved. And we are going to move forward now with the Battle of Assunpink Creek, which will involve British soldiers. So Washington, who is emboldened after the Battle of Trenton, recrosses and then crosses once again the Delaware River over the next 10 days, fighting a delaying action at the Battle of Assunpink Creek and winning another victory at the Battle of Princeton. The Battle of Assunpink Creek is sometimes re referred to as the Second Battle of Trenton. After Trenton, Washington withdraws back into Pennsylvania, anticipating a strong British counterattack. Howe is furious. Howe, being the British general, is absolutely furious with what happened at Trenton. He cancels Lieutenant General Charles Cornwallis's scheduled leave back to Britain for the winter. He also orders him to Princeton immediately. 8,000 British troops converge on Princeton on the 2nd of January, and Cornwallis begins marching them south toward Trenton, sending an advance guard. Washington's men, who have been paid an extra $10 bounty to stay for an additional month, cross back over the Delaware on the 29th of December and take positions south of Trenton on Assunpink Creek. He also sends another line of command under French Brigadier General Fermoy north of Trenton to delay the British advance, or north, I should say, of Assunpink Creek to delay the British advance from Trenton. When the advance line meets the oncoming British, they take cover behind trees and in ravines. Remember, the British thinking that this is a very ungentlemanly way to fight, and it greatly delays Cornwallis for much of the day. General Fermoy, who actually gets drunk, goes back to Trenton, and Colonel Edward Hand takes over the line. The advance line is driven back to Assunpink Creek by twilight, and the full British army begins an attack on the bridge over the creek. Washington's men hold back three charges by the British. Hundreds of British soldiers fall in the process. And what it causes Cornwallis to do is he holds a council of war to say, hey, what are we going to do here? Cornwallis lost 365 men, while the U.S. loses about 100. Some of Cornwallis's officers want to attack immediately, while others want him to wait until the morning. Cornwallis ultimately decides to wait until the morning, believing that he had already beaten the Patriot forces who were worn out and they had nowhere to go. Washington takes advantage of the delaying action, of the delay, I should say, by the British. In the middle of the night, 
he withdraws most of his troops in silence and sends them north to Princeton, leaving about 500 soldiers at Assenpink Creek to keep fires burning to make it look like his full force is there. When Cornwallis gets up in the morning, Washington's entire army is gone. They marched to Princeton and took over the 1,200-man garrison there. It's the third American victory in nine days, forcing the British to withdraw from most of New Jersey back to New Brunswick, where Rutgers is current day, and New York City for the winter. To cut Princeton off from reinforcements, Washington detaches 350 troops under General Hugh Mercer to destroy the Stony Brook, Brook Bridge. Pardon. After leaving the 40th Regiment of Foot to garrison Princeton, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Mawhood sets out with 800 soldiers to join Cornwallis at Trenton. There are 276 troops with him when he reaches Stony Brook Bridge at 8 in the morning. The rest are about a mile behind him. Mawhood expects an unimpeded march straight through to Trenton, but he looks back and notices what seems to be a patrol of about 400 men who were not British. A moment of fear and panic sets in with Mawhood. He's thinking, how the heck did these guys get here? Quickly, he turns his troops around and orders them back across the bridge. The high ground, not Trenton itself, is now his primary objective. Mercer realizes the hill's importance and leads his men there. The race turns into a complete melee of confusion as the two forces confront one another at Clark's Orchard. After several volleys, the British fix bayonets. Only about 20 of Mercer's militiamen carried muskets where you could mount a bayonet, and most had rifles that were much slower to load and shoot than a smooth bore musket. The colonials fall back before the intimidating British rush forward. Mercer says, no, forward, forward. A bayonet then pierces his chest after, and then one after another. A dozen blows or more and Mercer basically dies on the hill that later bears his name. At that point, some of Colonel John Cadwallader's troops come up over Orchard Hill, but the British push them back as well, leaving basically bayonet-pierced patriots all over the field. A rout of the colonials seems imminent, but then their commander suddenly appears. While Nathaniel Green rallied and reorganized his troops, Washington advances to within 30 yards of the British line of battle. A round is fired, and suddenly Washington is surrounded by smoke, and a full volley of musket balls is sent his way. When the smoke clears, somehow Washington is still on his horse. He orders a charge. The Patriots regroup, and soon it's the British who fall back. Remembering the enemy bugler's call on Harlem Heights, Washington pushes forward, crying out, it's a fine hot fox hunt, boys, unquote. Remember at Harlem Heights, the colonials were upset when British buglers were basically playing out fox hunt calls. Just to the north, General John B. Sullivan is busy, is busy engaging the British. After outflanking their defenses with two regiments of his own at Frog Hollow, he manages to push the British back toward Princeton, 
where they take cover in and around Nassau Hall, which was part of the College of New Jersey, which is modern day Princeton University. Captain Alexander Hamilton leads the firing upon Nassau Hall, which is bombarded with artillery. Apparently, one ball tears, cannonball, tears the head off of a picture of King George II, the current king's father. At that point, the British surrender almost 200 prisoners of war. As you can see in many of these battles, the number of dead and wounded are not big. It's the number of prisoners of war. What happens in the revolution is that you're on the honor system. When prisoners of war are released, they're basically sent home with a promise that they will not fight again. Whether or not that happens as much as is promised is a question that is still asked to this day. But the fact that that's one of the stipulations of battle is amazing. Mawhood realizes his only chance is to break through to Trenton. He is a legend in Great Britain to this day. He leads the British in a bold charge in defiance of the numbers that are against him. He's outnumbered. He escapes. Washington follows him closely for some time, captures several more prisoners, but knows it's only a matter of time until Cornwallis is going to show up with fresh troops. Wisely, Washington has his men destroy Stony Brook Bridge as Cornwallis is arriving. In his assessment of the Battle of Princeton, Washington reports that the British lost about 500 men, killed, wounded, and prisoners of war. He estimates that the Colonials lose 30. After Princeton, independence, which once was regarded as being on its last legs, becomes, a, although it's still a distant goal, it's much more obtainable. The French, who had been ready to do whatever damage they could to the British, felt confident enough in the rebellion's prospects to send supplies to the Patriot troops. We're still a little ways off from French recognition. In July, the British take 264 transports south towards Philadelphia from their encampment in New Jersey. As they approach Philadelphia, Howe is informed of, of Patriot fortifications and a small naval force in and along the Delaware River, blocking his path. Howe changes his course to the Chesapeake Bay, planning to land at Elk Ferry and march his troops 30 miles roughly northeast to Philadelphia. When Washington learns of Howe's movement southward, he marches his army south to Wilmington, Delaware. He arrives on the 25th of August. That same day, Howe lands with his army at Elk Ferry. On the 3rd of September, the majority of Howe's army starts marching towards Philadelphia, which is, at the time, the rebel capital, if you will. That's where Congress is meeting. Howe moves forward in two divisions. One is commanded by Lieutenant General Wilhelm Niphausen, and the other by Major General Charles Cornwallis, who we will hear from later in the Revolution. The next five days see both the British and Patriot armies positioning themselves along the White Clay Creek, west of Wilmington. Washington expects Howe to come at him in Wilmington. Howe, however, once would prefer to meet Washington elsewhere, 
preventing Washington from making use and taking advantage of the ground in Wilmington that Washington occupied. Howe makes a feint north towards Pennsylvania and it forces Washington to move to the Brandywine Creek at Chad's Ford, which is between Philadelphia and Wilmington. On the 8th of September, Washington orders Maxwell to take up positions on the White Clay Creek while the main army is encamped behind the Red Clay Creek just west of Newport, Delaware. A small British force marches to demonstrate against the colonial's front while the main of the British army marches around Washington's right flank. On the 9th of September, Washington realizes Howe's plan and orders a redeployment of the U.S. main army to Chad's Ford on the Brandywine Creek. They camp on the east bank. Washington positions his army on the high ground east of Brandywine Creek. He positions brigades and regiments at the main fords where the creek can be crossed, including Buffington's Ford, Chad's Ford, and Pyle's Ford. Washington is told by one of his military advisors that Howe would try to outflank him by sending his main force northward towards Philly while a decoy force attacked at Chad's Ford. Washington is aware of this, but had been assured by locals who knew the geography well that Jeff Jefferis Ford which was the next ford above Buffington's, was difficult to cross because it was deep and it was greater than half the height of a man, and the road southward from that ford was very poor. Washington expects the British to cross at Chad's Ford, so he puts most of his army there. Washington prepares to prevent possible British flanking movements to the south and north. Piles Ford, which is south of Chad's Ford, is covered by two brigades of Pennsylvania militia commanded by Brigadier General John Armstrong. Nathaniel Green's 1st Division is assigned the primary defense of Chad's Ford. Green's troops straddled the Nottingham Road leading east from Brandywine Creek. To Green's right is Brigadier General Mad Anthony Wayne, Colonel Thomas Proctor's Continental Artillery Regiment is placed to Wayne's right on the heights at Chad's Ford. So you can see Washington is concentrating his forces and his most reliable underlings, if you will, at Chad's Ford. Chad's Ford is at the point where the Nottingham Road crossed the Brandywine Creek on the route from Kennett Square to Philly. It's the last natural line of defense before the Schuylkill River. The Brandywine Creek, which was shallow, was very fast flowing. It was fordable at a small number of places that could be covered easily. At Chad's Ford, there are two fords about 450 feet apart. The creek was about 150 feet wide, and it was commanded by heights on the other side, the heights where Washington puts his artillery. The surrounding area has thick forests, low hills, farms, meadows, orchards and such, just to give you an idea. On September 11, Washington had been receiving conflicting reports throughout the morning about the location of Howe's army. He considers crossing the river to launch an assault on Nipphausen, but holds back. He wouldn't receive another reliable report until the early afternoon 
And by that time, quite frankly, it's too late for the Patriot Army. At 6 a.m., Howe sends half of his army, about 8,000 men, straight to Washington at Chad's Ford to act as a decoy. The force is, late, is led by Niphausen. The rest of Howe's army marches north, 17 miles total, to cross the Brandywine Creek above the fords that Washington had guarded. Howe then marches south to launch a surprise attack on Washington, on his right flank. Niphausen's force had advanced only three miles before running into U.S. forces, or I should say colonial outposts, near Welch's Tavern. Niphausen's men drive into the pickets, the colonial pickets, west of the creek. By about 10.30 in the morning, the British had cleared the west bank of Brandywine Creek and took up positions on the high ground overlooking Chad's Ford. After Washington receives reports from several officers that Howe was making a flanking movement, Washington plans to make an attack on Niphausen. He then receives a report from Sullivan that say the earlier reports are bogus, they're incorrect. Washington therefore decides not to go ahead with his attack on Niphausen. At 11 in the morning, Howe crosses the west branch of the Brandywine Creek at Trimble's Ford. He then marches east, crossing the east branch at Jeffries, at Jeffries Ford, pardon me, about three hours later. At 2.30 in the afternoon, how seizes and occupies Osborne's Hill just behind the right flank of the colonial forces. He then gives his troops an hour to rest. After Howe is spotted, Washington has no choice but to make a defensive stand. He orders his reserve troops to take up positions near the Burn Birmingham, pardon me, the Birmingham Friends Meeting House. The house is a small Quaker church on the east side of the road leading southeast from Jeffrey's Ford and about two miles north of Chad's Ford. Directly across the road to the west was Birmingham Hill, a small hill which really played into Washington's hope for defense. Sullivan then receives another report about British movements. The situation demands quick action. Washington responds by ordering Sullivan to abandon Britain's Ford and join the force at Birmingham Meeting House, where Sullivan takes overall command of three divisions. While putting the division into motion, Sullivan encounters Colonel Moses Hazen, who reports the sighting of the British advance guard. Sullivan rushes to take up positions on Battle Hill. At 4 p.m., Howe's troops form into line for the assault on Battle Hill. The attack begins before Sullivan's troops have a chance to take up the positions that they need to. One of his brigades almost melts away immediately. Washington orders Nathaniel Green to march to Sullivan's aid. On the right flank, U.S. artillery opened fire on the advancing British troops. The British are forced to halt and take cover a short distance from the base of the hill. At this point, Howe and Cornwallis order a series of attacks on the left of Washington's line the right and the center of the hill, gradually forcing the Patriots off the hill. After an hour and a half of very fierce fighting, hand-to-hand -hand fighting at some points, the British push Washington's forces back and take possession of Battle Hill. After the loss of Battle Hill, Washington's priority for the rest of the battle is the successful withdrawal of his army. His concern is, 
If I get wiped out completely here, that's the end of the revolution. At 5 p.m., after hearing the battle to the north, Niphausen launches his own attack on the very weakened colonial center at Chad's Ford. Niphausen's troops rapidly push the Patriots back and capture most of Washington's artillery pieces, pieces he can't afford to lose. Washington now has no choice but to break off the fight and escape as quickly as possible eastward with the remainder of his army. Fighting continues until dusk, by which time ammunition's running low or is, for all intents and purposes, gone. Washington's army retreats to Chester, which is 12 miles east of Chad's Ford. Washington, of course, is getting pilloried by Congress as the battle is in their backyard. And he says, hey, wait a second, I got bad intelligence. He also says a serious error was made by leaving my right flank open, but that was left open because of the bad intelligence. Even though Hal claims a victory, he once again allows the Americans to escape, much like he did at Assunpink Creek, much like he did in New York City. On the 12th of September, Washington issues orders for his troops to press on to Germantown in Philadelphia. The exhausted British do not pursue the Patriots, but remain behind camping on the battlefield at Chad's Ford, treating their wounded, burying their dead. The Battle of Brandywine is one of the largest land battles of the war, and the only battle in which Washington and Howe fight head to head. The victory is actually, it's a British victory, pardon me, it's a British victory, but the U.S. Army, the colonial army, lives to fight another day. It is one of the first battles in which the Ferguson rifle is used and in which the Betsy Ross flag is flown. The British overall have a just under 600 casualties. Only 40 of those casualties are Hessians. So it shows you what Howe is thinking, what he thinks of the Hessians after Trenton. He says, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose with my guys. There is no casualty report for colonial forces at Brandywine, and no figures are ever released. The estimate is that there are about, and this is really in a report that Howe sends to the Secretary of War, Lord Germain, he says that the Patriots had about 300 killed, 600 wounded, and almost 400 made prisoners. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. However, this is one of the battles in which the Patriots lose, have more casualties than the British do. Although Howe had beaten the colonial army, the unexpected resistance that he met prevented him from completely destroying it. Also, him not following up the victory. Colonial morale had not been destroyed. Despite losing the battle, colonials are actually in good spirits because they're saying, hey, we can fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys. Neither commander, Washington, Washington, pardon me, or Howe had proven themselves in the battle. Again, Washington had committed a pretty serious error by leaving his right flank open and nearly brings on the destruction of his army had it not been for Sullivan, Sterling, and Stevens's divisions that actually buy time for him to retreat. How waits too long to attack the colonial right flank, showing again that he doesn't have the killer instinct. He doesn't have the initiative because he is still afraid. And this is the fallout 
from Bunker Hill. He's afraid of sustaining heavy casualties. British and colonial forces maneuver around each other for the next several days with only minor encounters such as the Paoli Massacre, which takes place on the night of September 20th and 21st. The Continental Congress abandons Philadelphia. First, they go to Lancaster for a day, and then they go to York, Pennsylvania, both about 75 miles, eh, maybe 60 miles outside of Philadelphia, to the west of Philadelphia. Military supplies are moved out of the city to Reading, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 to 40 miles west of Philadelphia. On the 26th of September of 1777, British forces march into Philadelphia triumphantly. It's the crown jewel at the moment, after New York. The turning point in the Revolutionary War begins after, shortly after, well, really during the Battle of Saratoga, but it begins as a plan by the British to control upstate New York and isolate New England from the southern colonies to bring a decisive end to the revolution. And it ends, of course, as the opportunity that the Patriot Army has been waiting for. British troops led by General John Burgoyne plan to drive south from Montreal to Albany along the water routes of Lake Champlain, Lake George, and the Hudson River. Once in Albany, they plan to join forces with two other British commands, one coming from New York City and the other coming east along the Mohawk River Valley. Burgoyne's advance southward falters in the forests near Lake George. What happens is that the colonial army cuts down trees, which slows down his, his movement. Um, by the time Burgoyne reaches Fort Edward, his forces are running low on supplies. A detachment of British soldiers is sent north, or pardon me, is sent, not north, but they're sent out in the countryside to get cattle and supplies from nearby Vermont. They overrun by colonists' voices or forces in Vermont, further decreasing the number that Burgoyne has that is active to fight. Separately, other British troops that were traveling from New York City under the command of our buddy General Howe decide to veer from the plan and take Philadelphia. And that's what we just talked about after the Battle of Brandywine. However, Washington's army retreated to York and prevented Howe from leaving and joining with Burgoyne. In addition, Washington realizes that a major battle is shaping up, so he's able to send some of his troops north. He also puts out the word that any militia that can join the fight would be appreciated. The result, much like Bunker Hill, is that a large number of regular troops and militia gather in the Saratoga area, which is upstate New York. General Horatio Gates commands the Northern Department of the Continental Army. He's supported by General Benedict Arnold and by Colonel Daniel Morgan. Morgan is a leader of about 500 expert shot Virginia riflemen. Gates' army strength is about 8,500. To disrupt the British advance south, Great, or Gates orders his men to erect defenses on the crest of Bemis Heights, which is part of a series of bluffs from which both the Hudson River and the road parallel to the river could be seen. So any British troops coming that way can be seen. In order to attack, the British would have to use the road and the forest 
and ve as as the forest and vegetation to the east, pardon me, were too dense to be used for cover. The Patriots also erected a fortified wall less than a mile from Bemis Heights. The wall extended about three quarters of a mile, creating a line like a large shaped L. 22 cannons are placed behind the wall, providing the colonials with ample artillery cover. It would be an extremely difficult position for the British to take. Remember, wartime during these, this period, it's considered ungentlemanly or unfair to use cover, to use a wall or a fence or a tree or a house as cover. You have to fight in the open. Of course, the Patriots are saying, are you crazy? We're not going to do this. On the 19th of September of 1777, Burgoyne divides his army of about 7,500 into three columns. He wants to use each column to probe the various colonial defenses. Morgan's light infantry engages with the center column on the 19th of September near the farm of John Freeman. It is a big fight, fierce at times, with the field changing hands several times. By the evening, the British, who were then reinforced by 500 Hessians, held the field, but the action, the, the fighting had actually stopped their forward motion. Hoping to be reinforced by Clinton and Howe from New York City, Burgoyne says, I'm going to dig in. As food is being depleted by the British Army, the army is then cut to half rations. It was stuck in the middle of the New York wilderness. The British had been looking for ways to get the heck out of there. While the British remained stuck, as forces, colonial forces are coming in. Remember, the call went out for militiamen in the army. Their numbers swell to about 13,000. Receiving intelligence that Burgoyne's men were on the move, they attack the British position, forcing them back. In the ensuing fight, a popular British general by the name of Simon Fraser is formal is wounded, mortally wounded, pardon me. He's picked off by one of Morgan's riflemen. The other thing during the war that the Patriot forces would do is they would aim for officers because their thinking was if you pick off an officer then the troops will be disorganized the british did not do this as much there is a story allegedly that a scot scotsman had washington in his sights but did not shoot him because he thought it unfair to take washington out the colonials have no problem doing this. The British erected their own defensive redoubt behind their forward position, and it was called the Balcaris Redoubt. It was formidable and well defended. The British retreated inside of it and held off the colonials. Another redoubt, the Bremen Redoubt, was erected several hundred yards away. It was not as impressive as the Balcaris Redoubt, and it was lightly manned by only 200 German soldiers, giving the attacking Patriot forces overwhelming numbers and superior firepower. Ben Benedict Arnold gallops into the fray and rallies the colonials in an attack on the Bremen Redoubt. During this fight, he sustains a serious wound in his left leg, the same leg that had been hit during his siege of Montreal. By the early evening, the Patriots secure possession of the Bremen Redoubt and a tactical advantage, as this is at the far right flank of the British lines. From here, the Patriot forces can easily get behind the British. Realizing the pickle that he's in, 
the British pull back, Burgoyne pulls his men back into their great redoubt near the river, and they hold out for several weeks. On the morning of October 8th, Burgoyne's army tries to escape north, but a cold, hard rain forces them to stop and basically camp near the town of Saratoga. Cold, hungry, and weary, they dig in and prepare to defend themselves, but within two days, colonial forces have them surrounded. After a week of negotiations, Burgoyne's army surrenders on October 17th, 1777. The British had been utterly humiliated. This is one of their major campaigns to basically slice off New York, northern New York, and New England from the rest of the colonies to end the Revolutionary War. Think of it, after the Battle of Saratoga, the majority of the action in the Revolutionary War is in the South. So the planning, you can question by the British here. The colonial forces prove themselves on the battlefield against the greatest army in the world. American morale is through the roof, inspiring independence even more so amongst those who may have been doubters. More importantly, the French say, we're gonna push our chips into the middle of the table and we are going to support the Patriot Army. Later, a year after the French, the Spanish then jump in on our side as well. A formal treaty of alliance is signed with France and the balance of the war, the balance of power in the war, starts to tip towards colonial forces. Now this is October 1777. We still have almost to the day, four years of fighting before the Battle of Yorktown. I am gonna end there for today. If there are any questions, please feel free to type them in and I will answer them for you. For those who, can, who may not be able to catch me here on Facebook Live or who have friends who can't catch me here on Facebook, I have a YouTube channel, History for Shut-Ins. If you go to YouTube and type in History for Shut-Ins, you will see every episode. All eight episodes will be uploaded tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you tomorrow, Wednesday, April 1st, April Fool's Day, at 5 p.m. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.